to praise God this morning. Come on and give him your best praise in this place. God, we worship your name. We glorify you. We magnify your name. We make you bigger in this place, God. Hallelujah.
bigger and bigger. Here we go. Let it be. your name up because you are worthy of all of our praise all of the honor all of the glory they belong to you would we lift our hands today and focus our attention on him 
and how great, how good he is. You're an amazing God.
for dying for us thank you for being the lamb that was slain for the sins of the whole world but if I make it more personal that was slain for the sins of me God thank you that you did not give up on me Lord Jesus because you are a faithful God you are a faithful God you are a consistent God and we love you today God we don't come asking for anything but we come acknowledging that you are El Shaddai that you are Emmanuel that you are the God that is with us you are holy, God, and we join the angels in heaven, and we shout holy, holy, holy are you, Lord. Holy, holy, holy are you, Lord. Thank you, God, for your goodness, for your amazing mercy, God. We thank you, Lord. We don't deserve it. But, God, you are faithful. And we lift you up. We lift you up. We lift our gaze. We don't focus what's in front of us. We focus on you. Because our help comes from the Lord. We thank you. We give you glory. We give you honor. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Can somebody lift a hallelujah in this place? Like you know that he's worthy and he deserves it. Hallelujah. Shout out to God with the voice of triumph today. He's the reason for the season. He's the reason I'm still standing. He's the reason I'm still going. He's the reason I didn't give up. He's the reason. He's the reason. He's the reason. Woo. You can take
take your seats in the house of the Lord, if you can. Hallelujah. Glory to God. He deserves all the praise. God, yes, God. He deserves all the glory and the honor because yes, he's God. holy. Oh, we are so thankful, God, for the life change. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I am so grateful for life change. My life is so different because of God, because of what he has done in my life. And, you know, life change is a word that we use a lot here at Faith Christian Center, and it is not cliche. Amen. God has done so much in our lives. If you just think, I've been thinking because we're preparing for NYE Live, and I've just been thinking about things like, man, my life one year ago, just one year ago, Amen. and what it looks like now. Amen. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, just shifting because we have announcements and God has so many wonderful things that he wants Amen. to do in the service. Just speaking of life change and the things that have happened in my life, um, I just want to talk about small groups. Because I know that there has been so much life change that has happened since we launched small groups in August. And I just want to announce to you guys that next Sunday, December 16th, we are going to open the registration for you to participate in small groups again. Amen. So that means life change is going to continue. So if you are interested in participating, I strongly encourage you. I was in a women's small group, and we have opened up. We have talked about, whew, just the wonderful things that God has done in our lives. And so I just want to encourage you to participate in men's, in women's in discipleship, in marriage, in singles, in business. That's our new one this in the spring. So participate. It opens next Sunday, the 16th. You can go to the website and under Get Connected, sign up, please. I'm telling you, your life will never be the same. Your life will never be the same when you connect to small groups. A lot of times we come into this place and we have four or 500 people in here and we come and we go, but when you can connect with people, outside of the church and share your life story you're doing life with people right and when you have those personal relationships it's just a, it's just something that is it's, it's amazing amazing so since we're talking about wonderful people i would love to honor some of those people today so if this is your first time here at fcc we want to recognize you so if you could put your hand up in the air real high so we can see you come on real real high come on fcc i see you all over the building those of you online, we wave to you as well. Amen, amen, amen. So on behalf of our pastors, Sean and Erica Moore, and the entire FCC church, we are so excited about you being here with us today. There are so many wonderful churches in the valley, but guess what? You're here with us, and we're so excited that you are able to do Sunday with us. So on the back of your seat, there is a card called the Connect card. We just ask that you take it out. If you can fill it out in its entirety, tell us a little bit about how you learned about FCC, about your experience here at FCC. And then also, if you have any prayer requests, we are believers in prayer. So we just want to partner with you in prayer. So please put that prayer request on the back. Hold on to that card because at the end of service, we ask that you go to our guest experience tent, which is outside, where you can learn a little bit more about FCC. You can ask some questions with our volunteers, and we just want to love on you a little bit. Amen? So if you could do that for us, we would be excited. But now, because I believe we're one of the friendliest churches in the valley, amen, we're going to demonstrate that friendliness. Please stand on your feet, love on each other, tell somebody you're so glad to see them this morning. Amen.
Well, praise God, bless God. We definitely have the spirit of fellowship continuing in the house. To all of our first-time visitors, all of our newcomers, we want you to know that every time you visit us at Faith Christian Center, you will always be greeted with, with love. It is now offering time. Praise God. Blessing time. You may be seated. At Faith Christian Center, we give intentionally, we give regularly, and we give sacrificially. We give intentionally because we give our money in assignment. We tell it what to do based on our budget. We don't just give haphazardly. We give regularly because we are fed a healthy diet of God's word in this house. It's an uncompromising meal that cannot be duplicated or replaced. We give sacrificially because we give above and beyond our tithes and our offering in the name of Jesus. I want to draw your attention this morning to a passage of scripture that's familiar with some of us and maybe not uh, with others, but it's found in the gospel according to St. John, chapter 3, verse 16, and it's very familiar, um, and it states basically, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but should have everlasting life. And I had some stuff that I had written down and everything else, but I'm just going to flow this morning because I just feel a need to do so. When we are in this season of, of giving and this season of, of, of just the holidays, it's, it's a festive occasion. It, it, it's good. It's nice. But when I look at what God has done for many of us in this house and what he's doing through us, giving is a necessary part because God's plan for human beings, for mankind, is intentional. I cannot tell you a gift that I've received that has had the impact of coming to know a living Savior. And it hasn't been a pair of shoes, it's not been a shirt, it's not been a watch, it's not been a tie, it's not been a car that I've gotten one yet, or anything else. But the one thing that has had the greatest impact in my life is coming to know who Jesus is. And that tells me that God is intentional. Some things when he can't find the you got Blessed Project launched Black Friday and will continue through Christmas Day. This part of FCC, God is intentional about what he's doing with those finances because lives are changing. When you come to know Jesus, things will not remain the same. Is the marriage kind of on the rocks? Are you challenged financially? Are you in a spirit or a place of depression? Are you just flat out exhausted and tired from too much work? God is intentional. When he gave his son Jesus, that was the answer to every problem mankind can ever have. There's no greater gift that can ever, ever be given than Christ Jesus. And when you sow into the good ground of FCC, you're flipping on a switch of power. You're flipping on a switch where God is intentional about being a blessing. Ain't no big eyes. Ain't no little use. Everybody has an opportunity to receive because of who and what he is. Because the God that I know and the God that I serve is intentional. From a slick rick to a Pastor Wilson, God is intentional. And he's a good God. So when you sow, there's an expectation that lives of people shall be changed. Let's raise our offering to the great high priest, our Lord and our Savior. Confess over your offering. Say something over your offering with intent. Father, as we come today, we just thank you, Father, for just the abundance of your grace and of your mercy. Thank you for the opportunity to sow seed into the good ground of Faith Christian Center where lives have and will be changed. Thank you, Lord God, for leaders coming out of this good ground. Thank you, Father, for those things that you've promised. You are faithful to see to bring to pass. So we join our faith, Lord God, as we cross the street, as we impact the lives of people in this community, in this city, in this state, and around the country and world because of what we're doing when it comes to sowing seed. We thank you, Lord. And as we join our faith together during this season, we'll be mindful of what you've done through Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. So as we do, Lord, and always, we give you and you alone the praise, we give you the honor, and we give you and you alone the glory. In the mighty, matchless name of Jesus, and everyone said, amen. amen and amen. You may receive the offering. You Got Blessed project launched Black Friday and will continue through Christmas Day. 
This holiday season, bless a total stranger with a random act of kindness and post on our You Got Blessed Facebook page. To find out more about the project and how you can participate, grab a YGB card and visit yougotblessed.com. Join us Sunday, December 30th for Youth Sunday. We will have two special services at 10 a.m. and 12 p.m. only. Children's services will be provided. And on December 31st, don't miss our NYE Live celebration. It will be filled with fun, fellowship, and a special message from Pastor Moore. Doors open at 9 p.m. and service begins at 9.30 p.m. Kids World will be hosting a pajama party for the children. Arrive early as seating will be limited. If you'd like to register for an event or class or find out more about FCC, be sure to visit our website at FCC-PHX.com.
Let's lift up this praise to our God.
somebody. Tell somebody it's working for me. Come on. Tell somebody, tell them it's working for me. It's working. It's working. All things are working together for my good. To them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. Glory to God. I find great comfort in knowing that God can cause something that was supposed to work against me and find a way to get it to work for me. Come on, isn't that the scripture that this light affliction, which is but for a moment, working for me a far more and exceeding and eternal way to glory. Amen. Since y'all are so excited, I want to say good morning to everybody today. Amen. I want to say good morning to everybody that is watching us online. We are glad to have you with us. Amen. Here at Faith Christian Center, we believe that all things are working for our good. Let's pray and get into the word today. Father, we thank you so much for your presence. And we know that you are here in this place. You inhabit the praises of your people. And I, I just believe, Father, that uh, you're, 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 you've stirred something in this atmosphere. And I just pray that you'll grace me to deliver the incorruptible seed of the word. Help me to share the truth in a way that your people can receive it, embrace it, and make it their own. I pray for revelation knowledge, God, that does not just inspire us but transforms us and changes us. I pray there's not one person under the sound of my voice that is resistant to the things that you have said but is instead open to receive that incorruptible seed and as it enters their heart may it bring about the change and transformation that they have been desiring the change and transformation that you've been desiring to bring to pass in their life and I thank you Lord for uh, gracing me to speak with specifics and details with the word of knowledge and operation even as I minister and I give you thanks in advance for every person that will be impacted and changed as a result of our time together in Jesus name and everyone in agreement with this prayer today says Amen. You can be seated. Well, we have uh, been on uh, in a series uh, for, for a little bit of time now, a little bit longer than, than uh, I typically do a series on the subject of church culture. Amen. And one of the reasons why I'm able to do uh, this series for so long is because even though the subject matter is the same, technically we've talked about eight different things over the course of the last few months. I mean, you know, celebrating one another's successes is a completely different message than accountability. Accountability is a completely different message than belief and trust. Belief and trust is a completely different message than excellence. So we've been talking about our eight code of values here uh, at Faith Christian Center. Uh, those eight code of values, they are excellence, belief and trust, authentic relationships, accountability, honor, uh, celebrating one another's successes, gratitude and thankfulness, and generosity. In Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18, the Bible tells us that where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. So where there is no revelation, where there is no prophecy, where there is no dream, where there is no insight, the people are, are they perish, they're unbridled, they're unrestrained. Things slip through the fingers because they're ignorant of the opportunities that have been made available to them. And how I many you know you not only need to be a part of a, a church that has vision, you also need to have a personal vision in your own life. I mean, if you don't have a vision uh, that, that is in front of you, then how are you going to know when you get there? Our, our vision here at Faith Christian Center is to represent Jesus and to change the way that people see church. So everything that we do, uh, of our, our resources, our manpower, our time is going towards the fulfillment of that vision. Now, vision provides us with direction. We all need that. But culture is a little different because culture is what grants us permission. So though our vision is to represent Jesus, is to change the way that people see church, our culture has to give us permission in order to bring that vision to pass. Now, if I thought y'all was excited, you know, about those other messages that we talked about during the series, about on honor, and then we talked about, praise God, that other message that you all were excited about on accountability. I can only imagine what's getting ready to happen tonight. The ushers are going to have to sit everybody down again, just like they did during those other two messages when I tell you what our subject matter is all about today. And on today, we're going to talk about generosity. Somebody sit down. Come on. Don't be, y'all don't get so excited. Yeah. I mean, ushers, get them back to their seats for today. We're going to talk today about generosity. FCC, Faith Christian Center, is full of people who give their time, their talent, and their treasure liberally. So we choose as a church. We don't have to. We choose as a church to give in, intentionally, regularly, and sacrificially for the fulfillment of the vision and for the benefit of other people. Amen? Amen. Now, when it comes to generosity, all of us have got to start somewhere. Turn to your neighbor on the side and tell them, neighbor, neighbor. 
when it comes to generosity, all of us have to start somewhere. As a young man who uh, grow, growing up in Michigan, uh, which was home to the big three, General Motors, Ford, uh, and Chrysler, uh, I had seen firsthand General Motors and Ford provide a, a very nice, uh, very comfortable life for many of my family members. And, you know, and, and, you know usually when, when, when your family works at a particular place, sometimes it may be assumed that that's exactly where you're going to work as well. And uh, even before I, I came to know Christ, uh, not to say that there was anything wrong with working there because, again, it had provided a great life for many of my family members. Uh, there was something on the inside, even before I knew the Lord, that just knew, I just knew that I was not supposed to work there. Again, not, nothing against those places. I just knew on the inside that that's, that's not where I was supposed to be. When people would ask me as a young man, what do you want to do when you grow up? My response was, was usually, uh, I, I want to I own my own business. And though I didn't tell everybody this in my heart, I would say, and I want to make a lot of money. <laughs> if God would have came to me in a dream like Solomon, or if God would have visited me like Gideon, and asked me what profession I would like to work in full time for a large portion of my life, I promise you that ministry would not have been my first choice. And the reason why ministry would have not been my first choice is because for some reason I was under the impression that there was a connection between spirituality and poverty. I thought, I thought that if people really wanted to know God, poverty was the pathway to God. And based on what I knew about religion at the time, the last thing God wanted any of us to have was money. Because as had been misquoted to me for so many times, money is the root of all evil. I mean, you know, the Bible doesn't say that money is the root of all evil. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. God doesn't have a problem with us having money. What God has a problem with is money having us. But even when something does not align with Scripture, you hear it enough, you hear it over and over again, and the media makes sure that they portray that anybody that is spiritual should never have too much money. That's why there's always a major conspiracy that comes out. Anytime you get someone that's worked hard, that's put in the labor, that's put in the time, you know, that's worthy and deserving of what they've received, and all of a sudden the media wants to always pretend that that individual who says that they know God must be involved in something that they have no business being involved with. And watch this. They don't even want to know the truth. They just want to make sure that everybody else understands that as long as you are spiritual, then you are supposed to be poor. And I mean, you know, there couldn't be anything farther from the truth. Now, I'm going to just be honest. Since we're, you know, we're, we're being honest today, I just want to continue to be honest just a little bit more. Amen. And uh, I'm going to just be honest. One of the things that I really did not like growing up was going to church. I'm like, what, man? What? I'm being, I just be honest. I, I really didn't like going to church. And not only did I not like going to church, you know, another thing that I didn't like? I didn't like offering time. I didn't like when churches receive offerings. And you know why I didn't like it? Because during offering time, I oftentimes felt like someone was trying to take my money instead of it being a time for me to give my money. I almost felt like they needed to change the name from offering time to taking time. Let me ask you a question. What time is it? Taking time. And I'm going to just be honest, every time I went to church, I felt like I was coming out of big money. Now, granted, we only went like once or twice a year. But that once or twice that I went, I was coming out of big money. I'm talking about every time I went. No, no, not two, one dollar each visit. And, and, and let's not talk about those churches that want to receive two or three offerings. Sometimes, sometimes you, you know, you, you, you can dodge that first offering, but then they're getting ready to receive another one. So I find a way to dodge that next one. And dang, they're going to have a third one. 
And what really used to jack me up <laughs> is when the pastor would ask the congregation to walk up to the front. <laughs> they put the offering bucket on the altar. And they say, if you're going to give today, I want you to, to bring your offering up to the front. Because now if I, if I was going to talk myself out of giving a dollar, now there was no way for me to talk myself out of it because, you know, these were small churches that I was attending. So it wasn't like, you know, you could blend in amongst the crowd. The last thing I wanted was to be the only person sitting out there who didn't walk up to the front and give a dollar. So I would walk up to the front, and on the outside, I would look like this. But on the inside, I would look like this. And like this. And like this. And like this. And like this. Because again, what I felt like was somebody was trying to take my money. When I had to walk up to the front and put my offering in the bucket up in the front of the church, I would always ball up my offering really small. <laughs> so that way, no one, or, or you know, just fold it in half until it can't be folded anymore. Where no one could see the numerical value of the president that was on the bill. Because even though I was giving big money, the last thing I wanted anybody in the church to know was that I was only given a dollar during the service. And for me, walking up to the front was, was one of those what I would call an all-in offering. You guys know what an all-in offering is, right? Y'all ain't never heard of an all-in offering? How many of y'all grew up in church? Raise your hand. Y'all you been in church all your life and you ain't never heard of an all-in offering? Ask your neighbor on the side, have you ever heard of an all-in offering? I can't believe y'all ain't never heard of no all-in offering. An all-in offering is an offering when you put your hand all the way in the bucket because you don't want everybody to know what you gave. And once you get all in, then you release it. You release it. Release it right now. Can't believe y'all ain't never heard of an all-in offering. I put my hand all the way in and I would release it down at the bottom. And when I look back at that time, you know what's crazy is that I never really considered ever giving anything more than a dollar. If I had my, my little money on me, you know, I, I got to the point because, you know, them two or three offerings, I got to the point where I just started leaving my money at home. Or, or leaving in the car. I'm just being honest. I'm just being honest. I'm being transparent. I didn't know the Lord. I'm just being real. And my prayer today, this is what I hope today. What I hope today is that as I am honest with you about where I started, that it will help you to be honest with yourself about where you are. As it relates to generosity. So, you know, I got to play, you know, with them two or three offerings. I just would start leaving my money at home or, you know, leave my money in the car. And then offering time would come. And I'd be like, oh, man, did I? <laughs> you know you left your money at home on purpose. <laughs> You're intentional. <laughs> <laughs> what was crazy is that I never even considered giving more of a dollar, giving more than a dollar. I never considered a five, a ten, and certainly a twenty, a fifty, a hundred. That, that was the devil. Because I'm just being honest, because in my eyes, it was kind of like, why does the church need money anyway? What, 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 is, what, is, uh, what is the church going to do with money? The church has God. Why do they need money? They don't have no, no bills to pay. Missionaries, it's, it's free to preach the gospel. It should be free to travel. It should be free to go all around the world. Amen. Be, they, don't, they don't send a money in to the electric company. They write down some scriptures. Do a real positive confession about how God is going to bless the electric company for allowing us to use the electricity for free. Mics don't cost money. Carpets don't cost money. Air conditioning don't cost money. Heat don't cost no money. Everything the church does is supposed to be free. 
That was my mentality. I was a mess. I was a good person, but I was the exact opposite of what God is looking for when he in, encourages us to engage in generosity. Let me give you some scripture on that. On 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 through 8, the Lord said, remember this, he who sows sparingly and grudgingly will also reap sparingly and grudgingly. And he who sows generously that blessings may come to someone will also reap generously and with blessings. Let each one give as he has made up his own mind and purpose in his heart, not reluctantly or sorrowfully or under compulsion, for God loves, he takes pleasure in, he prizes above other things, and is unwilling to abandon or do without a cheerful, joyous, prompt to do it giver whose heart is in his giving. And God is able. We could stop right there, close our Bibles, and go home on just God is able. God is able to make all grace, every favor, and earthly blessing come to you in abundance so that you may always, under all circumstances and whatever the need be, self-sufficient, possessing enough to require no aid or support and furnish in abundance for every good work and charitable donation. I think this is so good. You know, the Bible says, number one, if, that uh, if you sow sparingly and grudgingly, whatever way you sow, you're also going to reap. And watch this, sowing sparingly and grudgingly is not just the amount that you put in, it's the motive behind the gift. I mean, you know, when a person gives but doesn't really want to give, I mean, you're, you're really kind of disqualifying the harvest that God wants to bring into your life. God doesn't want you to give sparingly or, grudg or grudgingly. As a matter of fact, if you feel like you have to give, you feel like you're being compelled to give, you feel like you're being forced to give, then don't give. Man, why? Because God would find more pleasure in you giving from your heart. You think about it. You know, when you ask your kids to, to do something and they, oh, 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 and they go through all those motions, it's like, well, forget it then. I don't want it if you got to go through all of that in order to give. And why in the world would God want us to give him a gift if on the inside we are going through all of these motions because we really don't want to be engaged in that activity? Instead of focusing on what's in your hand, you need to first of all deal with what's going on in the inside of your heart because that's where God's going to find the joy when he sees that you get excited, that you're a prompt to do it giver. When the Lord speaks to your heart and you're ready to move, you're ready to sow, you're ready to be a blessing, you're ready to be generous to somebody else. God likes people that are just like him when it comes to giving. Woo. And notice what God said. He says that I'm able. Now we know that God is able even outside of 2 Corinthians chapter 9. But I don't think it's coincidence that at the end of God talking about generosity, he said there is something I am able to do in the life of a generous person that I am not able to do in the life of a stingy person because a stingy person won't release what they have so that I can release what I have. But a generous person who gets excited about giving, amen, and wants to be a blessing to somebody else, releases what they have, and God said I am able to make all grace abound to towards them so they always under all circumstances and in all things all of their needs will be met with an abundance of side Woo, hallelujah any hilarious prompt to do it joyous givers in the house today glory to God you can get excited about giving anytime you want let me ask you a question. Maybe there are some things that you, see, I share my struggles. I, see, don't, don't assume just because I'm generous today that I've been generous my whole entire life. That's the reason why I shared the truth about what my journey has been like, about where I started at and how God used generosity to bring about a change and a transformation on the inside of me. And maybe there are things that you struggle with too when it comes to generosity. I, I mean, what goes off on the inside of you that no one else knows but you and God when the subject of generosity comes up. Let's face it, even in churches, generosity is the most popular message that the saints want to hear. Even though Jesus told us it's more of a blessing for us to give than it is to receive. Even though Jesus told us that we still believe it's more of a blessing for us to receive than it is for us to give. Now, I remember that there was a time in my life where I thought generosity was optional. And don't get me wrong, I, I felt like generosity was something I should do, but didn't necessarily feel like generosity was something I needed to do in order to move forward with my life. And I've been in ministry for a little while, you know, so I've been around the block a few times, and I've seen this even in the lives of other people. 
Because you can tell most, a lot of people consider generosity to be optional. Because when life hits them, the first thing they stop doing is giving and serving. And watch this. If people thought that giving and serving was not optional, but was something that was needed in their life, then all hell could break loose. And they would make sure if there are two things that are going to continue in my life, the two things I am never going to stop doing is giving to God and serving. Because Jesus said, whoever's going to be great in this kingdom has first of all got to be your servant. See, before I came to Christ, I really didn't know how important generosity was. So as I was preparing for this message, I, I kind of just reflected back over the, the last 23 years and, and, and started to identify some of the ways that generosity has added value to my life. And I thought about how one of the things that God has used generosity to do is God has used generosity to break greed's hold over my life. How you know it's been broken? Because I can give money away. See, again, what, I, what God doesn't have a problem with is with us having things. What God has a problem with is with things having us. And when God speaks to you to give something away and you can't do it, listen to me, you can point your finger at rich people and wealthy people and act like they have a love for money, but if you can't obey God for the sake of what you have in your hand, then what you have in your hand, you're not just gripping it, it has a grip on you. When I look back over my life, I start to see that generosity helps to remind me about how good God has been in my life. See, the blessing with being a tither is that every time, I, every time money comes into my household, my household gives 10% of what comes in. And we don't just tithe off of our paycheck that we get every two weeks. We tithe any time we get blessed. If we get a gift, if we, got, if, there, if we have a birthday and we get blessed, we tithe off all of those things. And what the tithe becomes is no different, uh, than, uh, no different than communion. It's a reminder of the goodness of God in our lives. Oftentimes, we live from big moment to big moment and don't even recognize the small moments. And God has given us stones. Like he told Israel, set up these stones as a reminder. And see, what happens is tithing is a reminder of how good God has been in your life. You're sitting in line, and all of a sudden, somebody decides to give you a pass. Something that would have cost you $5 cost you nothing. See, when you tithe off of that $5 and give that 50 cent, you remind yourself that, God, you're moving in little ways. Even if I don't see you moving in big ways, I see that you're moving even when I didn't know it. When I look at my life, generosity, God has used generosity to empower me to become the answer to somebody else's prayer. So many people are so focused on getting their prayers answered. But listen to me, there's another level to this. Another level to this is when you're not just waiting for someone to be an answer to your prayer, but that God is able to send you out to be an answer to somebody else's prayer. Listen, you didn't know what it feels like to pay off somebody's bill, to pay off somebody's debt, pay off somebody's car, to give a car away. You need to know what it feels like to do these things. Well, I didn't get no amens on that. God has used generosity to teach me obedience through a series of money tests that I've had to pass over the years. Man, these money tests, it's, it's interesting. this is what's interesting. What's interesting is that God knows the figure that engages your heart. You, you ever been ready to give something? Oh, yeah, Lord, I just want to be a blessing. And you got ready to give it, and the Lord was like, no, don't give that, give a thousand. And when the Lord said thousands, like, like the hair stood up, the sweat started to accumulate on the back of your neck. Watch this. God knew the number that would engage your heart. Because see, wherever your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I've learned obedience through God speaking to me over the years about giving things away. It's times I've, I've given away, I've had on a suit, given away to tie just because somebody liked it. You know, at times where I was at, I remember one time I was at home and, and I felt led. I had, I had just a, a little wad of money in my drawer and uh, I was getting ready to get dressed. I was going to leave the money at home and the Lord told me to take, the money, to take that money with you. Take that, take that money with you to church tonight. And I didn't, he didn't tell me why he wanted me to do it. And I just did it. I put it in my pocket. I got to church. Somebody came up at the end of the service in line, needed prayer for something. And, and what they needed prayer for, I knew exactly why God told me to put the money in my pocket. 
Come on, there are going to be a series of money tests that you're going to pass over the years. God is going to teach you obedience in the little things. The Bible says, if you haven't been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? Amen. If you haven't been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, how will he commit to your trust the true riches? If God can't trust you with a dollar bill, how is he going to trust you with his anointing? How is he going to trust you with the glory of God? Amen. If you put more value on paper than you do on something so powerful that it will transform your life and the life of somebody else, he's going to prove you with this so that he can cause a powerful anointing to rest upon you. Listen to me. When God gives you favor, one day of favor is worth a thousand days of labor. Favor will open up doors that money cannot. Favor will bring you into rooms that money can't even bring you into. And that's what happens when you get freed from money is God starts to show you what happens when he favors you in this life. Man, God has used generosity to help me face my fears about not having enough money. Listen, if you are afraid of not having enough, generosity can do something about that. See, faith is more, more of an action than it is in an emotion. It is, a, it is a conviction, a firm persuasion about something that you heard that drives you to action. And sometimes you've got to do it scared. And what the action does is the action activates your faith. Because when you act, then it's kind of like, all right, I ain't got no other options. Now, nah, I'm going to have to believe God. And sometimes you need that. You need, it's not all of the time, but there are sometimes. Uh, B option, C option, and D option need to be eliminated just so that you can stand in faith to believe that God is option A and can take care of you no matter what. Come on, somebody say amen to that. When I reflect back on my early days, I'm going to be honest, I don't recall anybody ever telling me why generosity was so important and what God had said about it until I got to Word of Faith and I gave my life to Christ. And Hosea 4 and 6 tells us my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. That word destroyed means my people are cut off. I was cut off from the blessing of God in my life because when I came to church, people talked about receiving an offering but never told me why. Not that I can remember. I never remember anybody saying why I needed to do it. I never remember anybody saying what God said in his word about the actual subject. Amen. And I'm going to tell you, there comes a point after you hear the word that now you, don't need, you shouldn't have to be convinced anymore. Now you need to act on what you know. I'm not generous today because people keep telling me I need to be. I don't have an alarm that goes off on my phone that says, today is Tuesday. Be generous today. Why? Because gener- generosity has become a part of my life. It's who I am. It's in my DNA. It's one of my values, not just as a pastor here. It's one of my values as an individual. It's one of our values that that we are endeavoring to teach our children as well, that we are not going to be people that hoard everything to ourselves. We are going to be givers. We are not going into the ground having consumed everything that came into our possession. We are leaving a legacy to the next two generations. Thank you for that. You see, that, that, that's how we got to grow. That's why I have to keep talking about generosity, because it's not second nature to everybody yet. If it was, we'd be more excited about it than we are. Now, I, I'm generous today because I've seen the value of, of, what, of what generosity adds to my life. Now, I'm just going to be honest. One of the things that helps me to be, gen- to be generous is planning. Uh, I'm the type of person I really don't like unexpected stuff. I don't, I don't like unexpected things to pop up in my life. I, I, I'd much rather plan. You know, and so what happens is I went from living off 110% of my income uh, before I came to Christ to uh, now, I mean, I just, when you, again, you think about generosity, all of us start somewhere. I went from not being able to afford to tithe to now, I mean, by the, by the grace of God, by the blessing of God, I think by the end of this year, my wife and I probably would have given away almost 20% of our income, amen, just on this year. Amen, because we don't just tithe, we're givers. But watch this. There's a plan built into the budget to be able to be generous. It's not just spontaneous giving. It's being intentional about generosity so that when opportunities present itself, we can be, and we're not scrambling trying to find money on how we're going to do it. Come on, I'm preaching good in here today. See, you think you're just going to write that million-dollar check one day just out the blue. No, you're not. You're going you're gonna to write a $100 check before that. You're going to write a $1,000 check before that. You're going to write a $10,000 check before that. You're going to write a $40,000 check before that. You're going to write a whole lot more checks before that million-dollar check comes. And watch this. When people give a million dollars, they don't just do that spontaneously. That's a plan. 
Come on, that, that's a plan. That's why December, all of a sudden, charitable giving goes up, not just in churches, but in all types of places. Why? Because people are trying to get that tax right off at the end of the year. <laughs> Another thing that helps me to be generous is knowing that when I take care of other people's needs, God will always take care of mine. Let me give you some scripture on that. The Bible says in Genesis 8, 22, that while the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, day and night, summer and winter, shall not cease. Amen. Give you the, give you the next verse. Uh, that will be Luke chapter 6, verse 38. God said, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured unto you again. All right, another one is Proverbs chapter 13, verse 22. It says that a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children and the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. All right, Proverbs chapter 22, verse 7. It says that the rich rule of over the poor and the borrower is servant unto the lender. How about Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18? But you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant which he swear unto our fathers as it is this day. How about Isaiah 48 and 17? Thus saith the Lord thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord your God who teaches you how to profit, who leads you by the way that you should go. How about 3 John 2? Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. How about Psalm 35 and 27? Let them shout for joy that favor my righteous cause. Yes, let them say continually, let the Lord be magnified who has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. How about Romans 8 and 32? He that spared not his own son but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? How about 2 Corinthians 8 and 9? For though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor that we through his poverty might be rich. Notice I didn't have to look to a screen. Those verses are in me. So that when somebody comes to me and says, it doesn't take all that, I got a, a reason for the hope that is in me with meekness and fear. I can give you verse. I can give you Bible. I'm not just doing it because somebody else told me to do it. I'm doing it because I know when I take care of somebody else's need, God always takes care of mine. See, when Jesus changed my heart, it became easier for me to open up my hands. Because the Bible says wherever your treasure is, there your heart will be also. We don't need time to open up to find out where your heart is at. All we got to do is follow your money. Your money will tell your story. Because there is a, a connection, no matter where this is at, there is a connection between something going on in here and the money you either have in your pocket or that you have placed in another institution. And God knows how to, how to give. God knows how to speak to you about the right amount in order to get this involved. Now listen to me. One of the things I've learned over the years, all of us, we have a giving capacity, we have a receiving capacity, and we have a spending capacity. God's challenged me on all three fronts over the years. There have been times he spoke to me about giving something. That uh, made me sweat when it came time to do it. There have been times that God has spoken to me about receiving something. And it was almost hard to imagine that God wanted to do something like that for me. There have been times God has instructed me to spend something for the furtherance of the vision or something in my life. And that price tag hit a capacity on the inside of me. And the Lord told me many years ago, he said, sometimes, son, you have to make vision decisions that are going to cost you on the front end but pay off in the long run. And, and I'm telling you, God will use money to, to keep pushing back and out that capacity because, see, if you can't go beyond that point, that capacity is going to limit what he's able to release in your life later on. Man, it's preaching good in here today. Go me to Philippians. Go to Philippians. Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, beginning at verse number 15. It says, Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church 
share it with me concerning giving and receiving, but, he, but you only. So notice when Paul first started, Paul didn't have a whole bunch of people sewing into his ministry. Only the church at Philippi actually got involved, opened up a giving and receiving account to help Paul preach the gospel in all places around the world. For even in Thessalonica, he said, you sent aid once and then you did it again for my necessities. Watch this, not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. So Paul said, watch this, I'm not asking you to give because I'm the only one that benefits from it. No, generosity benefits you too. I'm looking for some fruit that will abound to your account. Anybody believe that fruit can abound to your account? Verse 18, he said, indeed, I have all in abound. I'm full, having received from Epaphroditus the things that were sent from you, a sweet smell and aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God, and my God. He didn't say not just anybody's God, but my God. The same God that I've seen supply all of my need is also going to supply all of your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Amen. Tell your neighbor on the side of you, I am so excited about this message. <laughs> Some of y'all couldn't even say it. You couldn't even say it. You couldn't even say it. You couldn't even say it. That's why I'm preaching on it today, because you couldn't even say that you was excited about this message on generosity. How many of y'all believe God can and God will supply all of your need? Absolutely. God can and God will. But watch this now. Your need is not always tangible. Sometimes what God supplies for you is intangible. See, generosity is a part of God's provision. So God has not only supplied your needs to live, he has also supplied you with a need and desire to give. Why? Because your needs being met in the future is not just solely based upon your ability to make money. It's also based upon your ability to give money. Ooh. See, God gives us intangible things that cause our tangible needs to be met. I'll prove it to you. Discipline is intangible. But look at how many needs, tangible needs, discipline supplies. Talent is intangible. But look at how many tangible things talent provides for us. Passion is intangible. But yet when a person is passionate about something that they do, uh, they will go above and beyond what is expected and people buy into that passion and it provides for them tangibly. Excellence is intangible. But yet when a person is excellent, people will pay top dollar for excellence. Hebrews 11 and 1 tells us that the things that are seen are not made of the things that do appear. So what you see didn't come from what you see. What you see came from something that you cannot see. God, who is a spirit who you can't see with your physical eyes, made this physical world that you and I live in today. So watch this. I became a pastor because of a love I had in my heart for people to hear the truth. So God supplied me with a love for people. That's intangible. And that love for people to hear the truth led to my tangible needs being met. Woo. Somebody's going to get this today. Somebody, somebody's going to get this today. I said, somebody's going to get this today. See, see many, some of you, some people think the only way to find wealth is by chasing it. And watch this. You're not supposed to chase wealth. You're supposed to be chasing God, and God is supposed to cause wealth to chase you. That's Matthew 6. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things will be added unto you. That's Proverbs chapter 3. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your path. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from the evil way. Verse, verse, verse number 10. Honor the Lord with your substance, with the first fruits of all your increase. So shall your barns be filled with plenty, and your presses shall burst out with new wine. When we talk about wealth chasing, you doesn't mean you should just sit at home and do nothing and wait for opportunities and business deals to come to you. But the point that I'm making is that some, some of you think, some people, some of you won't do anything unless you get paid. 
Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm about to meddle a little bit. I'm going to meddle a little bit. I was sitting in my car at Arizona Mills, and the Holy Spirit started dropping some specifics in my heart. Some of you will not do anything unless you get paid. And watch this. This is what's interesting. Because, see, you understand the receiving side of this but don't understand the giving side of this. You want the world's best and don't want, have, don't want to have to pay the world's price for it. You pray and ask God for God to send somebody into your life to hook you up. Yet you don't expect God to use you to be the hookup in somebody else's life. I'm just saying. See, just because you're getting paid doesn't mean you're fulfilling purpose. And I'm going to just be honest. One of the things that I've learned is that a lot of times in the early days of anything, you do a lot of sowing. You do a lot of giving. In the early days of anything. Amen. And, and the Lord just, he really told me this, you know, really was speaking to me as I was sitting there at Arizona Mills in the parking lot for a few hours. He said that the enemy sees this in some of you. And that's why for you, your temptation is going to come in the form of business deals. Financial opportunities. Watch this. Abram left Canaan land and went to Egypt because of money. Said, oh, that's no big deal. There was a famine. He, there was, nothing was producing in the land that he was supposed to be in, so he went to another land. Yeah, he went to another land, but guess who he met? He met Hagar. Had Abram never met Hagar, he never would have had a son named Ishmael. Had he never had a son named Ishmael, everything going on between the Muslims and the Jews, Palestine and Israel, wouldn't be happening today. It only happened because somebody started pursuing money instead of pursuing God. See, dollars and destiny won't always take you to the same place. Some people, unbeknownst to them, watch this, they will pass up God-ordained opportunities that don't pay on the front end but bless on the back end. See, Jesus told us the kingdom is like a man that cast seed into the ground. When you think about a seed in comparison to a harvest, how many people would take a seed over a harvest? Which means there are going to be times people are going to look at things and it's going to look so small and so insignificant and be like, oh, I don't need that. And it's going to be kingdom. Because God most of the time is not, going, is not going to start you where he wants you to end. He's going to start you in a place that's going to humble you. And watch this, you, you got people in your ear telling you, don't do nothing for free. Don't do nothing for free. Don't do nothing for free. You better not do nothing for free. Don't do nothing for free. You got to charge. You got to charge. And, and I'm not, watch this, I'm not saying that the laborer is not worthy of his hire. I, I'm not saying that. But to think that you have to charge and hoard for everything that you have, that's, that's not the way. In order for you to be successful, that, that's not going to take you to the destiny that God has for you. Generosity has added so much value to my life. That uh, even if I decide to get into some ventures outside of the nonprofit sector, I'm already convinced generosity, uh, even in business, needs to be a part of what you do. Why? Because generosity separates you from the pack. This past weekend, uh, we did uh, one of our outreach events in the community. We did what we call the laundromat takeover. And so we went to, um, we, we had volunteers that went to, uh, volunteer staff that went to, I think, nine, nine laundromats throughout the city. And uh, we basically gave away $300 to the people that came to that laundromat um, uh, just, just to be a blessing to people in the, in the community. Here, here down the street, this laundromat down the street, we gave away $500. And, and this is what people said. When we gave the money, we gave people $10 rolls of coins or a $10 card. When we gave the money, several people said this, what's the catch? It was like nothing, no catch. It's just, this is our You Got Blessed project. We do random acts of kindness for total strangers from Black Friday all the way to Christmas Day. We're just trying to be a blessing. And what happens? Generosity separates you from the pack. It separates you from your competition. Jesus said it's more of a blessing for us to give than it is for us to receive. He didn't say that you can't have a good time receiving. 
What he said is that if I were to line up giving right next to receiving, I can do a whole lot more with giving than I can with receiving. I'm going to get a whole lot more out of giving than I will out of receiving. Giving has more options, has more possibilities. It's going to bring more joy into your life. One of the reasons why some of you don't have any joy is because you're waiting to receive. And if you would just go give and put a smile on somebody else's face, it would make your day. Depression would break. Come on, depression would break. Depression would break in your life if you could just get your focus off yourself and put your focus on somebody else. A lot of times, the longer that we're in the kingdom, we stop growing outward. And like an ingrown hair, we start growing inward. Because for some reason, we develop this mentality that we've got to take care of us in order for us to be okay. You know, all that scripture, you're going you're to focus all of it on you. All that prayer time, you're going to focus it all on you. All that time you've been confessing, you're going to focus it all on you. All your finances, you're going to focus it all on you. You're like an ingrown hair. And you think you're blessing yourself. You're long underneath the surface, but you hurt on the outside. The Lord told me this. He said, he said that there are people who don't have any plans on becoming generous until you make it. You don't have any plans on becoming generous in, until you make it. And I really felt like the Holy Spirit sent me here today to tell you, if that's your plan, you might make it. But watch this. You won't just have money. Your money will have you. Why? Because generosity needs to grow as you go. You can't just turn this on when you become wealthy and think you're going to just all of a sudden now give away a whole bunch of stuff. And you didn't give away anything when you didn't have a whole bunch of stuff. See, the tithe is in proportion to what's happening with you. God's tithe don't increase to 35% like the government. God's tithe doesn't go up. It's still in proportion, which means that if you make a little space when you don't have a lot, then a, then a little space will still feel like a little space when you have a whole lot more. I told God, Lord, as you increase my household, I'll increase what I do for your household. And I'm not talking about the tithe because that, that's automatic. You can count on the mores will always be tithers. I'm talking about offering. I'm talking about gifts. I'm, I'm talking about outside of that. God, as you increase us, I will increase you because I will increase what I do for your house because that tithe is a reminder of how good you are to us in this life. Amen? When it comes to generosity, as I, as I close, all of us start somewhere. And I just think about how I went from a young man who thought giving a dollar to God was too much. Giving a dollar to a church was too much. And now I've gone from someone that struggled to give a dollar to being the leader of an organization that's used to be a distribution center to other people in need. How God has given me the honor of overseeing a ministry who's made generosity one of its values who sets aside 10% annually of what comes in to give away then outreaches like the laundromat takeover. We don't have to receive another offering. We set it aside. It's a plan. Amen. Give away to other ministries, other churches, other organizations, other communities and people that are in need. You, you all don't know about the people we help behind the scenes and, and with all types of stuff. because We just don't get up in the pulpit and talk about it all the time. But we can't preach generosity to you and not live generosity as leaders and also as an organization. God has entrusted me with the responsibility of running a You Got Blessed project every year from Black Friday to Christmas Day. Where we go and do random acts of kindness for total strangers just because. He trusted me with a, a message to teach to the congregation, to not consume everything that you have, but to be thinking about your children and your children's children. 
to delay your gratification if necessary so that when your body goes into the ground and your spirit goes up, your children are not starting from scratch just like you did. What has God been dealing with you about as it relates to generosity? Has God been trying to use generosity to equip you, to empower you, to break barriers in your life? God has brought many of you a mighty long way. He's brought me a mighty long way. But listen to me, when it comes to generosity, all of us have got to start somewhere. For some of you, today is your starting point. For others, it's your time to start again. To no longer be that ingrown hair. To no longer be the dead sea that only receives but doesn't give. If you understood how much value generosity brings into your life, you would take it out of that optional column and move it into something that is needed for the future that God has for you. Bow your heads with me. Father, I thank you for this message and for the things that you have spoken into the hearts and lives of people today. I pray that those that need to get started will start. Won't be resistant, won't fight, won't kick against the pricks. If this message was for them, then God, I pray they'll just do what they got to do to get started, to get going. You got a big future for them, but they have a part to play in this. There are others, Father, that used to have generosity as one of their values. But for some reason, maybe over the years, Father, they've drifted away and they need to start again. I believe that you not only supply the, the need and the means to give, but you also supply the heart to be able to do it as well. So I thank you for the desire, God, inside of the hearts of people in this place to be generous, to give what you have placed in their hands. And God, I come against fear today. I just, I believe some people are afraid that they will not have what they need as they honor you with generosity. And God, I pray that they are reminded as they stir themselves up that you didn't give them a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. I thank you for everything you have for people, God, that are in this place, the future that you have, the provision you desire to release. And God, this is all a part of the plan. We could be generous and not be one of your disciples, but we cannot be one of your disciples and not be generous. You require this from all of us. And I just pray that people will embrace the grace that comes, that you are not alone. You don't have to do this by yourself. God is with you, and he's ready to equip you to walk it all out. We give you praise, and we give you glory for that today. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Anybody get something out of today's message today? No one's trying to take anything from you. Amen. We're trying to equip you with something that's going to bring great blessings into your life. Amen. Praise God. Well, listen, if you need prayer for anything, you want to know the Lord, you want to receive Christ, you want to you invite him into your heart, we're going to have a minister down front who will be available to pray with you, pray for you. If you need prayer for anything else outside of that, someone will be available to pray with you and to pray for you. If you're a first-time visitor today, we want to thank you so much for coming. 
Amen, and uh, hope you had a good first time with us. We would love to have you back with us again. On your way in, you should have, you probably passed right by what we call our guest experience tent. If you didn't get a chance to stop in before service, please stop in after service. We have some light refreshments, some snacks, some uh, people want to meet you, greet you, answer any questions that you may have. We are so glad that you came, and we pray that you had a good time with us. Amen. 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 Praise God. Y'all smile a little bit more. Come on, it's Christmas time. <laughs> 